Well, good morning to you and welcome to the online service for St. Peter's Stapen Hill. If it's your first time here, you're very welcome. If you've been before, welcome back. My name's Steve and I'll be leading us through our online service today. At St. Peter's, we meet together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to sing praises to God, to pray for ourselves and others, to have a time of confession and to hear God's word explained to us from the Bible. Lyrics for songs, words for the confession and reading are going to be on the screen. However, we would recommend having a Bible open or BibleGateway.com open at Ruth chapter 4 for the sermon later. Let's commit our time together in prayer. Our Father God, thank you for bringing us here this morning. Thank you that you promise in the Bible that when we gather in your name, you are with us. Lord, please bring us understanding and the wisdom and courage to apply your words to our lives. Amen. Today's hymn really takes a step back to look at all the things God's done, not just in creating, but in sending Jesus to die for us on the cross. Then it looks at what God's promised about the future, that eternal life with him. In the perspective of such amazing love and promises, let's sing together how great thou art. After this song, please have those Bibles open as Paul is going to be reading and Geoffrey will be explaining Ruth 4 to us.
Ruth, chapter 4. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there, just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here, and they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalising transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian and Marlon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Marlon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nation. Nation, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Come divine interpreter, bring us eyes thy book to read, ears the mystic words to hear, words which did from thee proceed, words which endless bliss impart, kept in an obedient heart. The repeat of Who Do You Think You Are? on BBC One TV last Tuesday evening is a reminder of the popularity at present of ancestry exploration. I am producing this sermon the day before I am to go to Barden Park Chapel for the burial of my brother-in-law John's cremated remains. John died on the 21st of June. 
and his children feel his remains should go with those of my sister in the grave of my mother in Barden Chapel Yard, right beneath Barden Hill, just beyond Colville. The remains of many of my ancestors on both sides of my family are in that chapel yard. They include those of my great, great, great Willet grandparents, William, 1773-1836, and his wife, Sarah, whom he married in 1791. William died aged 75 in 1836 and Sarah in 1840. My mother's side are easily traced back to great, great, great grandparents Joseph and Elizabeth Kellum, married in 1817. Their daughter Mary um, married William Lovett, and their younger son Frederick married Mary Taylor, and they moved from Baden in 1884 to live in Shobnall Street, Burton on Trent. Their grave is to be found in Stapenhill Cemetery, where Catherine's cremated remains lie, as will mine. And with my death will come the end of both Love It and Will It names, uh, though the children of William and Susanna had lots of children in the early 19th century. And whilst in Markfield, I christened and married more recent descendants, very distant cousins, who will keep the Will It name alive. Now, Forgive me for sharing all that personal information, but it's my introduction to the last five verses of the book of Ruth, repeated by St. Matthew in his genealogy of Jesus, and earlier added to the final chapter of the story of Ruth. In addition uh, to that, interesting um, story. Uh, Matthew includes three other interesting women, two of whom gave unusual births. Tamar, you can read about her in Genesis chapter 38. Rahab in the second chapter of Joshua. Bathsheba in second book of Samuel chapter 11 and 12. Not forgetting, of course, out of this ancestry, the Virgin Mary herself. Now, picking up verses 1 to 12 of Ruth 4. In studying these verses, it is important to reckon with the subject of leveret marriage. This idea is referred to in Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 25. And in the case of Naomi and Ruth's widowhood in Deuteronomy chapter 25 verses 5 to 10. They read as follows. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. The husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfil the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. If a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders at the town gate and say, My husband's brother refuses to carry on his brother's name in Israel. 
he will not fulfil the duty of a brother-in-law to me. Then the elders of his town shall summon him and talk to him. If he persists in saying, I do not want to marry her, his brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, take off one of his sandals, spit in his face and say, This is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's family line. That man's line shall be known in Israel as the family of the unsaddled. Such is the result of not carrying out the provisions made in the case of a man dying without children and his brother taking over the responsibility he's left behind to preserve the family name. Well, you may remember from the last chapter that Elwin shared with you, Ruth, during a night after working, uh, gleaning wheat, uh, had a very private interview with Naomi's kinsman Boaz, who promised to sort out the consequences of this evening encounter uh, the following morning must have been exciting to see how this would be achieved, given the existence of a kinsman closer to Naomi than Boaz, who had befriended and supported Ruth in his fields. So the morning came, and Boaz went up to the town gate, where a court of ten elders of the town was assembled, uh, with the other kinsmen who had a prior right to Boaz in carrying out this duty uh, to the two widows. As far as Boaz and Ruth were concerned, it was fortunate that the first kinsman who came along the road not knowing what he was going to meet, eventually uh, declined to carry out his duty. He had priority over Bohat, but said he could not afford to perform this service uh, to the family. Uh, he just couldn't manage to buy a field that Naomi was to sell, and also uh, to look after her daughter-in-law, Ruth. You bite, he said to Boaz. And he removed his sandal to make the transfer final. This shedding of a sandal continued in the spirit of what you heard in Deuteronomy um, as a sign of a, an agreement made and a transfer final. Only last Sunday at 8.10am on the Sunday programme, the account was given of recently discovered correspondence between the Pope and Henry VIII regarding Henry's divorce from Catherine of Aragon, his wife. Henry had argued that his marriage to Catherine, his deceased brother Arthur's widow, had been invalid in the light of Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 16. Do not have sexual relations with your brother's wife. That would dishonour your brother. Henry had chosen to overlook Deuteronomy chapter 25, which I've just read to you, which the Pope Clement VII was not slow to point out Henry's neglect of what presumably he had acted upon when he married Arthur's wife Catherine um, was Henry's undoing as far as a smooth divorce was concerned. Verses 9 to 17 conclude the story of Ruth 
and move back to the emphasis on her mother-in-law Naomi. Boaz reminded the elders and all the people that they were witnesses to his purchase from Naomi of all the property of her late husband Elimelech and their deceased sons and acquiring Ruth, her son uh, Malan's widow as his wife. The witnesses asked God to give him offspring by Ruth. So he and Ruth married and she gave birth to a son they called Obed, which has the connotation of servant in the name. And so Naomi now had a kinsman redeemer and Ruth was acclaimed better than uh, seven sons. And the story ends with Obed laid in the lap of Naomi. Now, lessons for us. After a bit of complicated Hebrew uh, law and theology, one or two very plain messages, I think, stand out. That first, our God is an active, caring God. We see him moving between and using Naomi, Ruth, Boaz, all carers themselves. Ruth, though a Moabite, uh, yet devoted to her mother-in-law, who accepted an alien uh, as her, her daughter. Boaz, providing work, protection, food for Ruth, even that final night of the private interview about her future with him. Uh, Ruth went away waiting for the morning to see how it would all pan out and indeed was given lots of food to take home to Naomi. And she'd already been more than generously provided for in the wheat fields where she'd gleaned. Boaz increased what she actually gathered. The unnamed kinsman redeemer and Boaz redeemers display God's redemption of Israel. His very work as God redeemer, just as those uh, men had to consider their calling. But God, of course, completes his work and does it thoroughly. You can read many verses in the book of the prophet Isaiah about God as our Redeemer. Let me just perhaps quote a few. For example, in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 1 can, includes from God, Fear not, for I have redeemed you, Israel. I have called you by name, you are mine. And it occurs again in the same chapter. God speaks of himself, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour, giving Egypt for your ransom. And makes it very plain that he is the Redeemer for the people. Repeating the word, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians in the ships in which they took pride. And you can work through all these verses in Isaiah. Uh, they're there again in Redeemer crops up in chapter uh, 44, um, verse 22, 47, verse 48. Again in chapter 49, verse 752, verse 9. Again and again, God as Redeemer speaks of himself and addresses his people as such. 
And of course, you will all know only too well that verse from the 19th chapter of the book of Job, that God is Redeemer to his people. I know that my Redeemer lives and that he will stand at the last day whom I shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold and not another. And needless to say, of course, in the New Testament, there is plenty of examples. In the letter to Titus, there's this little passage we regularly hear at Christmas time. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself the people that are his own, eager to do what is good. And you only need read Paul's early letters in Ephesians, in Colossians, and there again you will find over and over again God redeems, God gives renewal, God gives a second chance and never ceases to be active in the lives of his people. How do we respond to such an active, loving, gracious God? Well, uh, you can see it in the book of Ruth, right at the end of our story. If I just read you a little bit from chapter 4, and... Uh, we, we read the women surrounding Naomi as she nursed Obed. Uh, and it, these are the words that they had to offer. Praise be to the Lord, verse 14 of chapter 4, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Your daughter-in-law who loves you do is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. But under God, as we make our response, it needs to be more than in words, but also include deeds. And we must take very seriously in this picture, in this genealogy of Jesus, the important presence of women. Some very strange choices there. As I said, we must take, as a result, very seriously the need to accept people of different races. What a, a relevant lesson to the problems that have cropped up in recent weeks in the United States of America with repercussions in our own land. Perhaps the inadequate response to Jews um, deprived uh, the country of a Labour government on December last year. Attitudes to others of different colours and races it can well be vouched for as essential if we are to respond to the God who chose these people you know, all those centuries ago. And of course we need to follow the example of Ruth, the care of Boaz, who took such care, and be carers, not least in a time when there seems to be a crisis of care for those who need it most. And we find the inspiration, perhaps in that familiar, fairly modern hymn, there is a Redeemer, Jesus 
God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Amen. Thanks, Paula and Geoffrey. Now we come to a time of confession. As Christians, we try to live in a way that would please God, but we often miss the mark by the way we act, the things we think or say. The Bible calls this sin. Sin separates us from God. However, God sent his son Jesus to take the punishment for our sins when we turn away from them and ask for forgiveness. We're going to do that now with the words on screen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, although we are sinners, you made us your sons and daughters when your Son took our sin on the cross. Yet we still sin against you, never loving you as we should, often doing what you hate. Have mercy on us, dear Father, though you have every right to be angry. Show us our sin. Lead us back from where we have gone astray and renew our longing to serve you, forgiven forever in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thankfully, God doesn't just leave it with us apologising to him for the way we've lived. He gives us a great assurance of forgiveness. God, our Heavenly Father, has promised to forgive all those who sincerely turn to him. He has mercy on each one of us, delivers us from our sins and strengthens us for his service through Jesus. Amen. Our second song today is all about that forgiveness we are given when we turn from our sins. Please join us in singing His Mercy Is More. After that, James will be praying for us. Darkness, new every morning. 
Praise the Lord, His mercy is Loving God, we recognise our responsibility to encourage and uphold one another and to live together in peace and love. We recognise our needs and our human weaknesses. Help us to remember that without you, we are nothing and that our purpose is to worship and serve you. Thank you for the opportunity of being together in prayer. As we look forward to the week to come, we pray for an awareness of your love and support in all we do. Merciful God, we pray for the many people who have contracted the coronavirus. Bring comfort to those grieving the death of a loved one and peace to those worried, fearful and uncertain as the virus continues. We also pray for governments and authorities who are developing strategies to contain and deal with the virus and those in health services who may be risking their own lives to care for sick patients. Gracious God, We pray for all those who are housebound and in nursing homes, those in hospitals, recovery and rehabilitation. We thank you for hospitals, health centres and all those working in sheltered accommodation and care homes. Father God, we pray for our children and grandchildren who are returning to school, colleges and universities to continue their education. We especially pray that all places of education will find ways of making teaching and learning safe as well as effective. Help all students in their daily lessons. Give them wisdom to listen and learn and to keep safe. Help their teachers and give them patience and knowledge to teach well and help them all as together they learn the lessons of life. Faithful God, we pray for the worldwide Anglican Communion. We pray for all who preach your word, inspire, lead and grow us as disciples as we reach out to others. We thank you for the support of Edward and Catherine Lobb. Give fire to their mission to share your love so that all may benefit from the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Loving God, we ask for your wisdom to discern your wishes and direction in our daily lives and ask for your help to know how to deal with others in our daily lives. Those we live with and work with, those we meet in shops and supermarkets, those with whom we share our roads and those who may serve us in cafes and restaurants. May we never be a stumbling block to those we meet and to live as examples of your love. Be with us and all who need your loving touch at this time. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Thanks for praying for us, James. Well, that's the end of our service here today. There'll be a Zoom catch-up starting at 11.30 if you're able to join us. And if not, we hope to see you back here at 10.30 next week or at one of our in-person services at 6.30 at St. Peter's. Let's close our time in prayer. Be with us, Lord, as we go out into the world. May the lips that have sung your praise always speak the truth. May the ears which have heard your word listen only to what is good. And may our lives, as well as our worship, be always pleasing in your sight. For the glory of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.